Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Ahead of World Malaria Day tomorrow, we bring you an extended episode of Malaria Minute, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute. In this episode, guest host Thomas Locke takes us to Capitol Hill, where we meet malaria scientists who have joined an advocacy group to lobby members of Congress to fund critical interventions against malaria. We hear from them about their work and what scientific messages they bring to D.C. to impart on policymakers who play a major role in efforts to combat this preventable and deadly disease. Learn more about the Malaria Institute's work at the link in the show notes. Let's listen. It's Tuesday the 12th of March, and we've brought the podcast to Capitol Hill, the political heart of U.S. decision-making. It's pretty early in the morning, not even 9 a.m., but there's a real buzz and excitement about the place. That's because malaria champions, U.S. citizens passionate about ending the disease, are about to lobby their members of Congress to fund interventions against malaria. They've been brought together by United to Beat Malaria, a global grassroots campaign of the United Nations Foundation. This is their annual leadership summit. Malaria is just horrible. There's not enough funding. And the only way that we can get that funding is spreading awareness for it. You know, the people on Capitol Hill are people too, so we just got to give them our stories. It's important that we continue to fund malaria relief uh, around the world because it's preventable and treatable and it's a disease that preferentially affects low-income groups and especially women and children, which are very vulnerable populations. Talking to both Florida reps and Florida senators, our main key issues are national security and how that affects global health security. On top of that, how that affects our military and service people, that's really important to most of our congresspeople as well. Among the over 100-strong group are scientists, researchers who have decided to step out of the lab to join the heart of political advocacy. We want to know why. What makes a scientist extend their scientific battle against malaria to a new front line? How are they using their expertise to strengthen the champion's efforts? And for those lobbying Congress today, what scientific messages do they have to share? Today, we're sharing the perspectives of David Sullivan, Tracy Lamb, Jenna Reed, and Louisa Messenger. Produced by the Malaria Research Institute at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. This is the Johns Hopkins Malaria Minute. Extended. On the sidelines of the Leadership Summit, in the days leading up to Hill Day, we set up interviews with the scientists in attendance. Maybe it's just the way I'm wired. I still can't figure out why everyone else isn't interested in malaria. David Sullivan is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. thought I wanted to be an engineer. My dad's an engineer, my three sons are engineers, and I got into college as an engineer, but I, I thought I could use my talents better in medicine. I knew in college I wanted to do medicine. I knew in medical school I wanted to study infectious diseases. And it was an easy decision in residency training where we see uh, young doctors seeing patients that I was convinced I wanted to spend my life working on malaria. In the lab, David is most interested in the diagnosis and treatment of malaria. Yeah, that's my research area. Right now, 94, 95% of the deaths are in sub-Saharan Africa in young children. Malaria, unlike HIV or TB, it's a killing disease in rural kids in Africa. A lot of other people, adults, get it, but it's treatable and curable. But most of the of our more than half a million deaths are in those young children. And so it literally does rob parents of the dreams that they have for their kids. They don't, it's taken away their kids from them. It does cause a lot of uh, sickness in all age groups and really drags down our community, affecting uh, women during pregnancy. I think it is a drag on uh, development of a community. You know, people might be, I guess, curious why a scientist who's focused on research into diagnosis and treatment spending time in the lab and in the hospital with patients, why 
a scientist would want to be concerned with advocacy, right? What motivates you to be part of that kind of, I guess, maybe bigger picture of malaria funding and malaria advocacy? Malaria is a big picture, period. You can't just stay on your focus siloed area. And it's also rejuvenating for me to hear people's enthusiasm, uh, their firsthand experiences. Different scientists at different times in their lives may be prepared or not to be the advocacy thing. So you can't do all things all the time. And I'm still learning. I, you know, in the beginning, I was not as interactive, you know, and you have other, uh, other pressures with, uh, with family and science. And so this is my first leadership meeting also. Uh, but I have talked to congressional staffers on, on uh, other issues. I think that there is a big return on scientific and monetary investment on malaria. Even though I've been at it for 30 years, I guess I'm still young and idealist a little bit on thinking that all the work is still very relevant, and it is, um, and that we can make a difference and an impact. And so you can call me an optimist or an idealist, but I still uh, think that uh, it's sometimes slow to see it because we get into incremental science, uh, so it's difficult. But so for me, that's the big picture, that uh, scientists and other individuals can make a difference on malaria. You can sort of see that tangible difference. I think from a policy perspective, being able to understand what the science is can help support policy decisions. And why do we do the science if it's not going to help us figure out what to do next? Jenna Reed is a graduate student in the lab of Tracy Lamb at the University of Utah, which investigates the immune responses to malaria. Both Jenna and Tracy are speaking in a personal capacity. People living in America don't think malaria is a big problem to their day-to-day -day lives necessarily. It used to be a big problem in this country, and then it was eliminated several decades ago. But I think what people don't understand is that uh, malaria can still affect their day-to-day -day lives. It has the ability to go anywhere. Um, as long as the mosquitoes are there, it can reach you. Science education can really vary across the country and across the world, and so I think it's a duty of scientists. We do this for the public. We don't just do it for our own interests. And so I think it is every scientist's duty to be able to share that and communicate it in a way that everyone can understand, because really this work is for everyone. Policymakers have a tough job. Uh, there's not unlimited amounts of money, and they have to make decisions. I think the real importance is putting malaria um, nearer the top of the agenda. And so without them knowing anything about it, that's never going to happen. It's absolutely critical that we're here and that we're able to explain the problem and how severe the problem is. I think that's really critical. Both of us actually had the opportunity to do some advocacy work with United to Beat Malaria in the fall. It was online. And so I'm very excited to be here to actually do this in person. I really, really thought it was very important to like talk to staffers in the, the different offices and try to like help educate them. Because I do think there is an educational issue as well where people just don't really know much about malaria. And when you meet with Congress people on Tuesday, what is the key message that you want them to take away? I think the key message for them is that infections don't respect borders. Um, I think uh, certainly at this summit, we are aware that we do have malaria transmission in America. It's not on the same scale as other countries in the world, but it's here. And so as long as we have malaria in the world, that risk is always going to be here. Um, so I think that uh, people do need to realize that this just isn't something that affects other people. It also affects us. Tracy has more specific messages about the two new vaccines for malaria, developed over 30 years and now pre-qualified by the WHO and being rolled out. They're an impressive feat of science, but aren't perfect, requiring multiple doses over multiple months with partial efficacy. Both of these vaccines are less than perfect and, and definitely need to be improved. And so I'm here to advocate for increased funding because that's the only way we're going to be able to improve the vaccines. We need to make them better, and we also need to make sure that they last as long as possible, and that's not currently the case. David and Tracy were part of an in-person From Research to Advocacy panel talk, priming the malaria champions before venturing to Capitol Hill. 
Joining them on stage was Louisa Messenger of the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, another scientist at the Leadership Summit, focused on the clinical trials for mosquito nets. I feel so strongly about malaria because it's not just the disproportionate populations affected, but it's the most marginalized demographics of society, particularly children under the age of five and pregnant women. I've been actively working in malaria since around 2015, and back then we were feeling so positive about the significant gains that we'd achieved since the year 2000. But disease progress has begun to stall. I believe strongly that the next five to ten years are going to be absolutely crucial as we push towards eliminating malaria in the year 2030. We have such a wide range of significant biological challenges, drug resistance, insecticide resistance, humanitarian emergencies, conflict, climate change, invasive vector species. We're off track so far to be able to achieve those goals. The next five to ten years is going to be crucial to reinvigorate funding and interest globally to essentially fight to eliminate malaria. And will you be joining folks on Hill Day to to lobby your member of Congress? I will do. I will be joining uh, two of us from the state of Nevada. We're out representing the Southwest in our fight to eliminate malaria. And what would be your message to your member of Congress? We are at a crucial time. The gains in malaria uh, were so hard to fight for in the first place, and the speed at which it's reversing is also so rapid that it's now more than ever that we need to act, and we need to act rapidly as a global community with improved funding and resources to push towards eliminating malaria. We talk a lot about the disease. We often forget a little bit about the mosquitoes that are involved in it. And often you won't hear about some of the exciting new developments like the new vaccine, like the brand new bed nets. Those were the trials that I was involved in. You won't hear about them until they've gone through uh, the WHO system and they've been approved. I want to raise awareness of some of the exciting developments that are up and coming. The scientists who attended the Beat Malaria Leadership Summit all agree that to make gains against malaria, the fight must extend beyond the lab and into the world of political decision making. With their expertise, they can help outline more clearly the policy problems and solutions. And their message to champions in Congress is clear. One, diseases don't respect borders. And two, now is a critical time to reinvigorate the fight against malaria. Part of the challenge is biological, which includes drug and insecticide resistance. Part of the challenge has to do with public health, making sure you have the right interventions delivered at the right time. The broader context of these challenges is political. As the largest government donor of malaria control efforts, US support, historically strong and bipartisan, is key. The messaging will be tailored to each congressional office, whether you emphasize the moral imperative, economic return on investment, or the risk to national security. But in meeting with over 160 congressional offices, the champions put malaria on the agenda. My thanks to David Sullivan, Jenna Reed. Tracy Lamb and Louisa Messenger for being today's guests, and to the United to Beat Malaria team for support in producing these interviews. You've been listening to the Johns Hopkins Malaria Minute Extended. I'm Thomas Locke. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace Ciceri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Ciceri and Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.